Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Abdul, sorry, Abdul Kadir Slocum. Uh, he's the co-founder of uh, a place called Chemothermia. And we're going to talk about metabolically supported chemotherapy, uh, which includes hyperthermia and hyperbaric oxygen and uh, possibly other treatments. So, Dr. Slocum. A.K.A. Abdul, thank you for coming. How are you doing? Fine, fine. Thank you. How are you doing, Richard? Good, good. Well, tell me about uh, you know how you first considered or ran into hyperthermia and hyperbaric oxygen uh, for cancer. How did you, uh, you know, what's your background? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll first start out like how we started practicing uh, things out of the box, let's say. Now at uh, Chemothermy Oncology at our clinic with my uh, two colleagues, Professor Berkarda and Dr. Mehmet Salih İyikesici. We started practicing together and founded our clinic around 11 years ago, uh, back in 2010. And especially my partner, Professor Berkarda, he's uh, 90 years old right now. He's the first medical oncologist of the Turkish nation. He was educated in, in the States, actually, at the University of Rochester. And uh, following completing his uh, medical oncology uh, training in the States, he came back to uh, Turkey and founded Oncology in Turkey. And following practicing standard standard of care uh, for over 30 years, him and uh, me and my uh, our other colleague, Dr. Yi Kesici, we've seen shortcomings uh, of standard of care. And uh, we've started researching with the main aim of trying to improve outcomes for patients. And that's how we uh, tumbled upon hyperthermia, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, other metabolic therapies also. And uh, that's how we founded our clinic and started practicing such out-of-the-box therapies. So that's the short story of uh, okay. how we got together and started everything. Well, why did you do these out-of-the-box therapies? I would think 99% of doctors won't do that kind of stuff. So why, why did you... The main issue is both hyperthermia and hyperbaric oxygen therapy. These are treatments uh, that work synergistically with uh, standard conventional therapies. And like besides having their own uh, therapeutic effect, they also uh, increase the efficacy of uh, most conventional therapies. Like if we especially uh, start out with hyperthermia, the hyperthermia treatment uh, is a treatment that has a direct cytotoxic effect and uh, it's a treatment that exploits the heat sensitivity of cancer cells by increasing the main tumor tissue temperature to 42 degrees or higher. And uh, in this treatment, what has been seen in uh, many different researches is that in it increases the efficacy of our chemotherapy, most chemotherapeutic agents and also radiotherapy also. 
And uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a treatment that mainly targets cancer cells by increasing ox- oxidative stress. And in many other researches, it's seen that tumor hypoxia is one of the main reasons that lies behind tumors, resistance, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy therapies. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a treatment that gets in the way of such resistance by increasing oxidative stress on the tumor tissue. And uh, in many different researches, publications, it has been seen that both hyperthermia and hyperbaric oxygen therapy, they work together well also. Uh, So uh, we apply these treatments together, mainly also concomitantly with our conventional chemotherapy treatment. Meanwhile, we, uh, as a clinic, we also apply uh, chemotherapy in a modified application method. The drugs that are being used are the same chemotherapeutic drugs in our guidelines. Meanwhile, we apply these drugs uh, in a modified application method, which we have named metabolically supported chemotherapy. In this application method, patients uh, come into the clinic in a in a fasting state, so following a 14-hour fast, a minimum 14 hours, some patients will fast for longer. They'll come into the clinic and following coming in, we'll check their blood sugar level. Based on their blood sugar level, we'll apply insulin to cause mild hypoglycemia patients prior to chemotherapy application. The main reason is causing acute metabolic stress on cancer cells prior to applying chemotherapy. So it's so-called applying chemotherapy while uh, cancer cells are under metabolic stress. So the drugs that are being applied will be the same drugs uh, based on guidelines, but f- uh, following this metabolic adjustment, let's say, uh, will apply chemotherapy. Why are you partnering this with chemotherapy? Is it because you have to, or is it because you've observed that it's more effective to still do well, chemotherapy with these treatments as well? Yeah, yeah. What, we, what we see is... Uh, Doing it together with chemotherapy is uh, is more effective compared to uh, singular therapies. Uh, so, like our background is like uh, with my colleagues, we're a conventional medical oncology team. Meanwhile, we we haven't rejected uh, like we apply many out of the box therapies, but we haven't rejected our conventional background. Our main issue is for us uh, to apply a therapy. It's uh, must be evidence based. And uh, like we apply hyperthermia, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, some other uh, infusional therapies. We apply to uh, our patients uh, carbohydrate-restricted diets, specifically to many patients' ketogenic diets. And the whole uh, reason we apply these is there is sound medical evidence behind them. And also in our chemotherapy applications also, we follow uh, guideline-based treatments. Okay, so you found that uh, the combination works better than just hyperthermia or hyperbaric oxygen alone. Yeah, yeah. We've not practiced alternative therapies only. Uh, What we have done is, in our practice, we've continued uh, our conventional guideline-based treatments, but we've modified the application method of uh, chemotherapeutic agents, and we've named it as metabolically supported chemotherapy. And together with this, as an add-on uh, concomitant treatment, uh, we apply hyperthermia, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and a ketogenic diet in most patients. And uh, to date, uh, we've made eight different publications since 2010. And in these publications, evaluated our treatment outcomes in the last 10, 11 years of treatments. And uh, we, what we have seen is uh, such combinatorial treatment leads to uh, very much increased survival times in many different cancers. And also uh, that treatment is much more tolerable besides it being much more effective also. So we have seen that uh, patients tolerate treatment much better, their quality of life is much better, and their survival time is much, much better compared to standard of care only. Well, how much more and for what cancers, you know, how much longer do they live? And again, for which cancers? What have you observed? Like, uh, we, we've made our first publication back in 2016 in stage three and four pancreatic cancer patients that had uh, been treated in our clinic from 2010 to 2015. Before we continue, 
I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. And in that case series, uh, it included 43 patients diagnosed with uh, stage 3 and 4 pancreatic cancer. In this diagnosis, uh, normal survival time with standard of care treatments is uh, roughly around nine months of time. Meanwhile, in our combinatorial treatment protocol, the median survival time of our patients has uh, was 19.5 months. And in standard chemotherapy, conventional care, the one-year survival rate of patients between uh, 20% to 48.4%. In our combinatorial uh, treatment, our one-year survival rate was 82.5%. And wow. when we uh, published, over half of these patients were still alive and healthy and many in remission. Following this publication, we, we made our uh, second publication regarding a rectal cancer patient, which had a locally advanced rectal cancer. It was uh, regarding a patient that was uh, 81 years old. And uh, the reason we uh, published uh, this case report was that she was a patient that in a normal standard evaluation was not eligible for standard of care therapy because of her age and other comorbidities. Uh, meanwhile, in, uh, in this patient, we applied uh, metabolic supported chemotherapy together with radiotherapy and hyperthermia. In her condition, this combinatorial treatment was tolerable and yielded a complete response in her condition, which was sustained for over two years, and we published uh, our paper at that time. This approach, as I said, uh, what we see is it is much more tolerable, and patients that normally might not be eligible for standard of care because of uh, side effects and toxicity issues, it's eligible, makes other patients eligible also because of its low toxicity profile. And following these two publications, uh, we made uh, we also made a publication regarding our outcomes in uh, stage four non-small cell lung cancer patients, and uh, which received a treatment protocol consisting of metabolically supported chemotherapy, together with hyperthermia, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and the ketogenic diet. This publication included patients again treated at our clinic uh, between. 2010 and 2015, and included 44 patients. And when we, in this uh, first, in this diagnosis and stage of disease, the uh, standard overall survival time in these patients is between six months to 11 months with standard of care. And in our 44 patient case series, we've seen that our patients' group's overall survival time was 42.9 months. We are, uh, compared to six months to 11 months with standard of care. Okay. So it's All much, right. much, much longer. And okay. uh, similarly, we've seen similar survival extensions in uh, gastric cancer patients, rectal cancer patients also, and we've made publications in those diagnoses also. All right. Well, for hyperthermia, can we go over it a little bit more? So how does it help someone that has cancer? You know, what does the treatment protocol look like? And then how does, what's, what's observed and how soon after the treatment is the effects observed? Like if you talk specifically regarding hyperthermia treatment, there are two different forms that we apply hyperthermia. One is whole body hyperthermia and the other is local hyperthermia. In a whole body hyperthermia treatment, it stimulates a fever in the uh, body and the body temperature is increased to around 39, 40 degrees Celsius. And so, as you know, when any of us get a cold or a flu or an infection, the natural response of our body is forming a fever. And this physiological response is because 
our body knows actually that at increased temperature, infectious agents and cancer cells are much weaker. While to the contrary, our immune cells function much, much better and effectively. Uh, so the whole body hypothermia works similarly to forming a fever in the body, uh, which weakens cancer cells while also increasing the effectiveness and stimulates uh, immune function. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Meanwhile, why, why, uh, does it, why does it weaken cancer cells? Why are they because, know, less tolerant because, of heat? Because these cells are cells that replicate very quickly and their cell membrane is different from normal cells. And uh, mainly because of this cell membrane structure difference, they're vulnerable to heat. Okay. So how many hyperthermia treatments uh, seem to be needed to have an effect? And, you know, what again, right after someone has a treatment, what's it like for them? If we talk about whole body hyperthermia, whole body hyperthermia is actually in our treatment protocol. It's the hardest treatment, like compared to chemotherapy even. It's a much harder treatment because you heat the uh, body for around 90 minutes, one and a half hours. And then this heat is conserved for an additional one hour more. It's a two and a half to two and a half hour treatment. And it's quite intense because at increased temperatures, our metabolic rate of the body increases. And it's a st- serious stress on the body itself while also causing stress on cancer cells. And is it exhausting like, but, or what, what happens? It's exhausting. Besides exhaustion, uh, no, no side effect is seen in our experience. So that's the main effect. There's exhaust, exhaustion. But in local yeah. hyperthermia, it's very well tolerated and patients feel nearly nothing, actually. But in whole body hyperthermia, it's an exhausting treatment. Is whole body needed for some cancers or is local rotating we, around different sites like, usually good enough? It's all based upon the patient's diagnosis and stage of disease. All patients at our clinic uh, almost always will receive local hyperthermia. And based on their diagnosis and stage, they possibly might also receive whole body hyperthermia. So uh, local hyperthermia is applied in all patients. And based on the condition and diagnosis, we in some or most patients, we will also have uh, whole body hyperthermia. Uh, but uh, we much more extensively and frequently use local hyperthermia. Okay, so is whole body needed? Or like what, what determines whether a whole body is needed or not? It's mainly about uh, if the patient has uh, especially parenchymal organ involvement, liver metastasis uh, mostly, we will use whole body hyperthermia. But if the patient has local or locally advanced disease, we, we will use local hyperthermia uh, treatment because it's uh, one, much more, it's easy easy on the patient, very well tolerated, uh, and also very effective. Okay. How many treatments typically does someone need? You know, I know it varies, but on average... Yeah, it, uh, it, it, it varies, of course. Uh, but uh, what we can say is, in our field, uh, mainly uh, the objective time of treatment response evaluation is 12 weeks of time. So patients uh, will always receive uh, like a minimum of 12 weeks of treatment. Of course, this is not every day. It, uh, the treatment schedule differs based upon their chemotherapy regimen. In some patients, their chemotherapy regimen might be once every three weeks. Other uh, patients it might be in two consecutive weeks and then two weeks breaks. Or in other patients, it might be every two weeks. So uh, based on their schedule, treatment will be planned. And what we mainly do is the patients will receive such hyperthermia and hyperbaric oxygen therapy the same day and the following days after their chemotherapy application. All right. And what about uh, hyperbaric oxygen? Is that just for solid tumors or liquid tumors or, you know, when's it good and when's it not so good? Like it's good in almost all kinds of cancers. And one main benefit of hyperbaric oxygen therapy is that besides increasing chemotherapy and radiotherapy efficacy, it also increases the quality of life of the patient. So it supports general well-being and organ function. So what we see has seen is that it makes treatment much more tolerable. And like back in 2010-11, our first uh, main beginning was with hyperthermia. And we later on added hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And after adding hyperbaric oxygen therapy to our therapies, what we've seen is mainly that treatment is much more tolerable. The blood cancer patients 
are much better and their general well-being is better also. So besides mm-hmm. increasing the efficacy of treatments, it's also supporting the quality of life of patients also. If you were to compare the hyperthermia versus the uh, hyperbaric oxygen, are you ever in a situation where you can only do one of them? Or do you always do both? And if you do both versus yeah. just one, how much better is it? Like we, we always do both. We always do both. Well, how much better is it to do both? Like, you know, do you, do you start with one and then the other? And what's observed once both are administered versus just one? Like we haven't evaluated uh, the exact difference between patients uh, receiving hyperthermia alone or hyperic oxygen alone. So uh, statistical significance wise. We haven't compared uh, two groups alone uh, compared to both together. But uh, as a clinical observation and outcome wise, like what we see is that both applied together is much more effective compared to chemotherapy alone. And uh, this observation and uh, also published evidence that we've seen from our practice is uh, similarly seen in other centers and researchers also, but uh, not from our evaluation. But there are uh, papers and publications that compare hyperthermia being applied alone or with together with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And what is seen is that when these two are applied together, the efficacy is much higher of chemotherapy. So we, based upon this evidence, have uh, brought together these treatments also. So we haven't compared applying one or the other and uh, see uh, check on outcomes. But uh, in other in vitro and in vivo trials and researches, it has been seen that these two together work synergistically. And based upon this, uh, these evidences, we've brought together these two treatments in our patients. Are there any other therapies that you want to add into the mix that you think will make things even better? Like the ba- uh, basic protocol is uh, metabolically supported chemotherapy, hyperthermia, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and the ketogenic diet, carbohydrate restricted diet. And besides these therapies, in patients, we also apply uh, mistletoe therapy and other supported infusional therapies such as high dose vitamin C, DMSO, B vitamins. So uh, based on a patient's condition, Uh, We also apply other therapies, uh, but the uh, basic protocol being applied to almost all patients is, uh, as I said, metabolically supported chemotherapy, hyperthermia, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and the ketogenic diet. So you have patients where you throw all that at them? Yes. And it's still not curing them, but it's giving them uh, like an extra year of life? We, we, We see much longer survival extensions also. Like as an example... Our most recent publication, we made our most recent publication around three months or so ago regarding a patient, uh, an end-stage breast cancer patient who came to us uh, back in 2018. She was an end-stage patient with widespread metastatic breast cancer uh, with active lesions in her uh, both lungs, uh, mediastinum, liver, abdomen, bones, and also brain metastasis. Uh, She was a patient that was found ineligible for any sort of treatment and was sent home. And in a consultation and second opinion in the United States, uh, she was also uh, evaluated as a patient who will pass away in less than one month of time. Uh, She uh, heard about us and came to us back in 2018. And following hearing about us, she came to us for treatment. And when she came, she was on oxygen support and I wasn't able to look at, look me in my eyes even. She, she was in a very bad condition. We took her on for treatment and she received this uh, combinatorial novel therapeutic approach. And uh, following six months of treatment, we sent her back home to Ohio in remission and we made our publication 24 months after. Uh, sending her home. So right now, from her initial application date, it's been over two and a half uh, years, around 33 months or so, since she first time uh, first came to us. And she's currently still in remission with no evidence of disease uh, mm-hmm. back in Ohio. So yeah, that's fantastic, uh, huh? and there, there are many more patients, many, many, many more patients. This is just one example. So the whole issue is You're maximizing the chances of the patient. Uh, And in some patients, this translates into uh, plus two years, some patients plus five years, some patients less, some patients more. 
But uh, what we see is their chances are definitely better because what in our practice, a patient is already receiving whatever conventional medicine will offer them. The chances of that are in their pockets already. And they, they'll have also additional chances from many other therapies also. So in our case series, we see serious uh, survival extensions patients. And in some patients, this is no evidence of disease for over five years also. So, yeah, but yeah. every patient is different, of course. Right. Which are the cases that seem to be even beyond your reach? I mean, they all seem to be get, to get better. But um, are, there, are there certain cancers or situations that you're having a really hard time making any progress in? Like... Not cancer-wise, but what I can say is one main determinant is uh, the willingness to get better, the wish to get better. If a patient has a positive mood and is in their deep in their heart, willing and wishing to get better, those patients do well. But if a patient doesn't have that in them, what you do might not change much. So one of the main determinant is the psychology, emotional, spiritual well-being of the patient is uh, crucial in getting a good treatment outcome. Why would some people not want to get better? I mean, I, I know it's getting into psychology, like, but like, yeah, are like, you able to, to figure that out not, in the beginning? It's not, it's not much about not wanting to get better, but like people having such a diagnosis, diagnosis is, is not easy. And following, progressing under possible many other uh, treatments, people lose hope and they lose their mm. belief that anything might help them. So once they come to that condition, changing that mindset can uh, become very hard. So they're fed up, actually. And, and that's the whole limiting factor for many patients. And let's say that patient uh, that uh, we published about and that I explained, like, I'll never forget, we're still in contact, of course. And even in her worst condition, like, she was dedicated to getting better. And uh, that's like, yes, our treatment is very effective, but uh, that dedication and belief in getting better is one of the serious determinants in an outcome. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So uh, where do you help people? Can anyone in the world come to you or just the United States or another country? Like, how yeah, do they like, find you? Like anyone, anyone can come to us. Like uh, we have many, pa many international patients, like around 40, 50% of our patients are international patients. And we have many patients from the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, Switzerland, Israel. So uh, many from many other countries, people apply to us. And we, prior to coming to us, of course, we make a detailed evaluation of their condition. And uh, if we think we can be of help to a patient, take them on for treatment. Okay. And where can people go to find out more about your work and uh, your clinic? They can go to uh, chemothermia.com and on our website, there, there's detailed information about the treatments that we apply. Also, our publications in this field and also uh, patient stories are also reachable from our website. Okay, well, very good. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, I'm glad that you're offering these alternatives to just the mainstream because the mainstream uh, doesn't seem to be working too well for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, personal Definitely, family experience yes. you know? so yeah yeah yeah unfortunately like there are serious shortcomings of standard of care and these shortcomings can be overcome with uh, such alternative complementary integrative approaches and we come from a conventional background but we've seen these shortcomings and that's uh, how we started everything and we we've been very surprised how how much outcomes can be changed like when we uh, we're initially starting. Our whole issue was just trying to do something to change outcomes. And it's been remarkable and amazing experience for us to see how much uh, things can be changed, actually. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Abdul, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it very yeah, much. It's great been talking to you. Sure. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. 
This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.